Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land. Welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. Today we're doing another book review and this time it is the eminent book The Scarlet and Black by Stendhal or The Red and Black depending on which translation you get. So without further ado let's dig in shall we? The Red and the Black, or The Scarlet and the Black by Stendhal, is the Dickens of a book to explain. Obviously it's not written by Dickens. Um, I use that as a colloquialism. Stendhal wrote it. But it's a dreadfully difficult to sort of lay out this book for a review. It's not that it's hard in the sense of its writing. In fact, in the introduction to this, Margaret Shaw, she writes that this book has no fine phrases, heroics, nor grand sweeps of imaginative writing. It's really sort of the kind of conversation you use chatting over the table in a pub. It's really easy to read, but there's something about this book which sort of niggles. I'll put it this way. Let me tell you an anecdote. When I was younger, in my teens, me and a friend, we decided to go off on a road journey uh, quite a long way up the country. We'd never done this before. I couldn't even drive at the time, and so I was holding the, the road map. And we drove through this one particular village on the way to our destination, and we took a wrong turn. That's fine. We're driving along, merrily chatting for half an hour, and then we realised something wasn't quite right. And I looked at the map and we turned it upside down a few times and realised where we had gone wrong. So we turned around, headed back down the road we'd come from, and lo and behold, that village we had passed through was gone. I don't know what turning we had made. I don't recall ever making a turning, but we lost an entire community of people. And that was quite disorienting. And we went through quite a bit of a time trying to get to a destination, but not knowing how to get there. And it was lovely looking at the scenery and all the monuments and, oh, that was grand. But after a while, that gets a bit frustrating when you can't work out where you're going. Now, that is The Scarlet and the Black as a book. It's got a simple enough great storyline to read. It draws you in. There's some fantastic things that you see along the way. But... By halfway through the book, you're sort of sitting there thinking, OK, Stendhal, what are you trying to get at? And that can make it a sort of difficult read to engage with. However, do not DNF this book. And for those of you who are new to the BookTube community, DNF means do not finish or did not finish. When you go to the end of this book, Oh my days, there is an explosion of realisation. Now, you already have an undercurrent of recognition of what might be going on, but it just leaves you at the edge of being certain. By the end, woof, it all comes together and it's, it's quite amazing. So let's give you a summary, shall we? The hero of The Red and the Black is a young man called Julien Sorel, and he comes from a small quite out of the way place called Verrières, not Derrières, although that would be quite appropriate because he starts at the bottom in life. <laughs> He's the son of a sawyer, a man who owns a, a, a sawing mill. And we're in the year 1828. What's going to happen is Julian Sorrell He's not cut out for working with his father. In fact, his father hates him. He's, he's small, he's not strong, he's gloomy, he likes reading books, and his two brothers are big, bulky blokes who can do all the work for their dad. And so he's just out of place. And he's a romantic because he's read a couple of books and he's talked to a man who used to be a surgeon in Napoleon's Grand Army. And the surgeon has told him about the campaigns with Napoleon in Italy and rising through the ranks. Now, this is very, very important right now. Back in Napoleon's day, you could be a common born person, but rise through the military to become a general. Julian dreams of making a better life for himself, for reaching the top, for being another Napoleon, as it were, to be a great person. And he is driven by ambition. He wants to better his position in life. But of course, he's stuck. Things take a change 
when the mayor, uh, a man called Monsieur de Renal, employs him to teach his children uh, as a tutor to teach them Latin because Julian has been taught Latin by the local priest and Julian has a remarkable memory and has memorized the entire New Testament of the Bible. And so he starts getting paid to be a tutor. This is okay, but for Julian, his pride is hit because he sits with the family of an evening at the bottom end of the table. He is still a servant. And this really rankles because at this time period, it's the revolution has finished of Napoleon's, the monarchy of France has been reinstalled, but France has had the taste of liberty. And so now you have these conflicting parties. You've got the aristocrats who want their position still, but you've got the liberals who are for liberty, so they say. And of course, they're able now through various uh, businesses and mercantile ways, they're able to make money and they too have influence in local government. All of this is going on, this toing and froing of power, while Julian wants to make his way in the world. So he goes to Monsieur de Renal, and Monsieur de Renal has a wife, Madame de Renal, who is very beautiful. I think she's about 10 years older than Julian. And cut a long story short, um, she ends up falling in love with Julian, and particularly because of his romantic ideal, this passion that he has. And they end up in an adulterous relationship. But for Julian, a lot of this is driven not by love, but because it's ambition. He, he's getting one up on the mayor, Monsieur de Renal, who is an old aristocrat who's lost a lot of his land in the past, but he's still well to do. He's still the mayor of the town. And so having a dominance over Madame de Renal is, does his ego a lot of good. But they actually sort of begin to fall in love until a bit of a scandal is ready to break out. And this brings up the next stage of Julian's life where he moves to the larger town of Besançon to join a seminary where he's going to grow up as a priest. The reason he's picking a priest is because now you can't advance in the army. All of the aristocrats get appointed to the high positions. We've gone back to that birthright way rather than through Napoleon's meritocracy. And what Julian has noticed is that a priest can tell people what to do. And he realises, if I go to the priesthood, I'll probably raise, rise through the ranks better that way. And so he goes to the seminary. Things are not straightforward there. Everybody hates him. And he has to learn to be hypocritical. After the seminary, he moves on to the third part of his life, where he gets invited to be the secretary of a marquis. And there the daughter of the Marquise, who is the most prized woman in all of Paris. She is the belle that everybody wants to marry their young son to. She falls in love with Julien. And by the end, Julien's about to inherit an estate of his own and to become part of the aristocracy. He's a lieutenant um, before everything comes all crashing down. So that overall is the plot but there's something bothersome about this book. And it's like going back to that anecdote. We're traveling through the book. We can see that Julian's trying to advance himself. But you can't work out the destination, as it were, that Stendhal seems to be going for. And for a modern reader, that's quite tricky. However, it does draw together at the end. And there are two pages in particular in one chapter, which poof, you said everything falls into place if you've been paying attention throughout. And I encourage you, if you're going through this book, to follow one of my tips, which is to write your notes as you go along. Whatever stands out to you, whatever your thoughts, jot them in the margins because it will prepare your mind for the sudden poof, flash of light that Stendhal gives you, which draws the whole book together. So now we're going to move on and we're going to say, what is this book about? There might be spoilers here, um, more than likely. So if you do not want to spoil it, maybe watch this after you've read the book. However, before you go, may I just say, you might want to watch this before you read the book because it might give you a starting point to develop your own thoughts on the book as you read through it. Because 
I can see this is a book which for many will be stopped halfway through because of that sort of lost feeling, that groping around in the darkness kind of sensation you get with it. I would say one of the first key areas that you want to take notice of is in chapter eight, the very first page of chapter eight, actually. There are things that have already happened up to this point, but this is very key. It's the priest who has taught Julian Latin um, and can see that Julian sort of has an ambitious eye um, working in the Renal household. He says this. If you were thinking of paying court to those in authority, then your everlasting damnation is assured. You may get on in the world, but you'll have to do things which will harm the poor and needy. You'll have to flatter the subprefect, the mayor, and in short, any man of importance, and make yourself the servant of his passions. Now, here is the interesting thing. Julian, remember, he's got ideals of being like in Napoleon's day, that through his own merit, through his own imagination and conduct, he can rise through society. But this priest is saying, if you want to rise in society, Julian, you will have to be obsequious and serve the passions of whomever you are trying to climb the ladder with. So as you enter different areas of society, you will always have to play the subservient role in order to get to where you want to go. It doesn't depend on your character. It doesn't depend on any special ability or gift which Julian has. You just have to suck up to people. Now, doesn't that smack of one, hypocrisy, and two, mediocrity. What kind of people can rise in that system? The mediocre. Anyone can rise in that. But it's commented about Julian that he's got something out of the common way which will guarantee him enemies. In other words, if someone is truly great, if someone's got something that they can actually improve society with on their own merit, People will hate them because they stand out and, and everyone is small minded and infighting and backstabbing and in it for themselves and petty. And that's the society Stendhal is saying exists in France at this point after Napoleon. Then literally over the page, we have this comment about Julian himself. The author says, we must not forecast too gloomy a future for Julian. He was discovering himself, and correctly too, the language of cunning and cautious hypocrisy. How to feign the correct appearance to get on in the world. And this is particularly true of this time period, as, as you read the book, it's quite an insight into, into the novel Examining History. Um, but Stendhal is definitely saying that the way to progress at this point is purely through fakery. And that's an important point to note, that Julian would like to progress to greatness through ambition, through his own strength. But the society of the day, Stendhal is saying, is set up in such a way that you have to tick lots of boxes and flatter lots of people in order to move on. And if you stand out in any way in your own right, then you haven't got a chance. You've got to become mediocre like everybody else. It could be easy to think that the hypocrisy is all on the aristocratic side because the liberals, as we tend to look back on history from today's perspective, um, from a liberal disposition, we think of the liberals as being upright, liberté, égalité, fraternité, all men are equal. However, later on in the book, Julian, still in Verrières, he goes to a man's house called Valeno. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's in English, it would be pronounced veil nod, but my French is awful. So Valeno, I think it is, whatever it may be. He goes to this man's house. And there, this man is a liberal. He's not from an aristocratic line, but because of his wealth, he has got this position as superintendent in the town. He oversees the prison and during the meal that Julian has at this man's house, the prisoners begin to sing in the background and he sends out some lackey to shut them up, probably through force. And what kind of liberal is that? It's supposed to be um, on the side of the common man, but here he is beating the poor prisoners. And Julian suspects that the grand banquet that they're having 
a lot of the money that came from it was actually skimmed off money that should have been used on behalf of the prison itself. Just look at the characters that are sat around the table. This is great for hypocrisy. There were several liberals in the company, wealthy men, but happy fathers of children qualified to hold scholarships, and who, on account of this, had suddenly become converted since the last religious mission. Do you get the gist of what's being said there? The church was sided with the monarchy, and when we say the church, particularly the Roman Catholic Church and the monarchy of France, hand in glove, they worked together. So the liberals had always had a wary eye of the church. But it says here, the liberals around the table, when their children had got scholarships to universities backed by the church, the liberals themselves had suddenly become religiously converted to agree with the Roman church. Hypocrisy. As they climb the ladder, they will change appearances to move the next step on. That's what he sees here. But we see the hypocrisy is not just in the elite clique, but in the liberals who have become rich. They too are hypocritical. What's interesting is when Julian goes to Besançon Seminary, the hypocrisy carries on there within the church as an institute as well. While he's being taught as an apprentice, and uh, all the others are with him, the other young boys come from sort of liberal families. They come from blacksmiths and from clothiers. And a lot of them are clever, like Julian. But they deliberately get answers wrong in their tests so that they don't appear to be too clever. Again, that's hypocrisy. And the reason they do this is to show themselves obedient to Mother Church, that they always need Mother Church to tell them what to do. And he soon realises, Julian, that what you're learning at a seminary is how to look pure, how to look holy and glum and solemn and to give almost like a PR stunt for the Roman church. So when you've got your abbés and curés that come out of the seminary, there'll be a model example of submission to God, but not God, the church. And because he's acing his exams, all of the students hate him. They call him Martin Luther, that enemy of the church, because he's an independent thinker. And even the priests teaching him hate him for getting everything right. They don't like the idea of a boy who can think for himself. He's dangerous. Shortly after all this, he goes on an errand to see the bishop. Of and it all transpires that Julian ends up getting sent to the Marquis de la Mole in Paris, where he serves as his secretary. What's interesting about this point Julian has been sent to the bishop by the one priest who's taking care of him called um, Father Pirat. And Father Pirat is a good man. He's actually devout. He doesn't like playing the games of hypocrisy. He just works for the church. Look at what he says to Julian as advice. I see in you something that offends the common run of men. Jealousy and calumny, that's slander, will pursue you. In whatever providence chooses to put you, your colleagues will never see you without hating you. And if they pretend to love you, it will only be to betray you all the more effectively. Now, here's his advice. Let your conduct be blameless. This is the only expedient I can see for you. If you hold fast to the truth with unconquerable tenacity, sooner or later, your enemies will be confounded. Now, this is in stark contrast to the hypocritical society. From what I get, Stendhal is no particular lover of the church. I may be wrong, I've not looked into his life, but certainly from this work, he's uh, very acutely aware of the hypocrisy there. However, this advice from Father Pirat is excellent, and it's almost something that Stendhal is backing up himself, that in this hypocritical society, the only real way forward is to hold with tenacity to truth, to be blameless. And actually, if you are blameless, your enemies around you can't quite get anything on you. That's the only real way to genuine success. This is hammered home just a few pages later when he speaks to this bishop. Well, you would imagine the bishop as a very great politicker to become that high in this society. However, we're told that this bishop is not concerned with what the political scene will be in 10 years time. In other words, he's old. He doesn't have to play the games anymore. 
and he just likes Julian. And when he's sending him on his way, he says, if you behave yourself, young man, you shall one day have the best living in my diocese. And that won't be a hundred leagues distant from my Episcopal palace. But you must behave yourself. So in other words, he too, be blameless, be of good character. The bishop actually knows that this is the best way forward. However, it's not the quickest way to advancement, nor the way to the top. What's of interest to us is that these characters, Father Pirat and the bishop who will retire, they recognise that the truth lies in being a good person, a genuine person. Whereas, of course, we've learned that Julian is already learning to be hypocritical, to learn cunning. But it's just interesting to see these characters say what they do. I want to jump ahead now to when, uh, for about half of the book's worth, when Julian is in Paris at the family de la Mole. And um, he's, he's meeting with Mathilde, who is the daughter of the Marquis who employs him as secretary. And the Marquis really likes Julian, by the way. He helps Julian sort of progress a bit in society, but he is still a secretary and Julian hates this because he's still a servant. However, he can carry out his role brilliantly. And he spends a lot of the time learning the sort of hypocritical ways of the aristocracy. In fact, he's given advice there. That they tell him he's a fool because he says what he thinks. They say, well, you. the advice given to him is you must say exactly opposite to whatever it is you truly believe. You've got to be a fraud. And he sees all these polished manners which impress him to start with, which he understands the aristocrats do have it, and it is something glorious. As he's with them longer and longer, he realises they are forced by form and etiquette to never deviate from a way of handling situations in society. And anyone who slightly steps out of line is ridiculed or is looked down upon or sneered upon. They sneer at him because he's forever making gaffes, although he doesn't know what they are. Uh, but he's forgiven because, you know, he's the secretary. Um, he's of a, a lower place. And they're impressed with his knowledge and his um, brightness. He's certainly got something. He's not a threat to them because he's lower born. But anyone else in their society, if they were to do the same things as Julian, boom, they would collapse down a peg or two. And so there's this constant pretense. Now, when it comes to Mathilde, this daughter, this 19-year-old girl um, whom Julian meets, here's how she's described. As he looked attentively at her, he thought he had never seen such beautiful eyes, but they indicated an exceedingly cold disposition. Later on, he decided that their expression was one of boredom, critical of everyone else, yet at the same time mindful of an obligation to impress other people. Now, Stendhal, particularly, in his past writings, had taken aim at the boring society of drawing room Paris. And he does it again in this book. He fully fleshes it out right here. People who may be in the glittering salons of the day are all bored. They're not to get over enthusiastic about anything. Anything that is of trivial concern, that's what you can talk about and enjoy. Anything serious, you must keep away from it. You mustn't over laugh. Everything is subdued. It's like love is even a calculated thing for Matilde. Everything falls into status and position and form. And of course, this stifles human beings. How can greatness grow anywhere in such a stuffy and oppressive climate? It can't. Stendhal saying, this is our society. You have the liberals who are greedy for money and they want position once they've got money because it equals power. And the aristocrats who they have to perform constantly as the paragons of society and you have to walk in such a, a fine way as to never incur anyone's displeasure and you're all backstabbers and you all are polite to one another's faces but it's all false it's fraudulent the church the aristocracy the liberals are all hypocrites you can see Stendhal saying a system like this is going to crash it's going to devour itself 
you can never make France great with this political setup. And such an idea is backed up by Mathilde's word herself. When she speaks of the young men in her society, they're all dukes and whatnots, she says, Is it my particular fault if the young men of the court are such staunch upholders of convention and grow pale at the mere idea of any adventure slightly out of the ordinary run? You see, Mathilde has read things of the past and she's enamoured with one of her ancestors who got beheaded. Um, in fact, she, she puts on mourning black one day a year when this, this ancestor of hers had his head cut off. And she loves the fact that his lover picked up his decapitated head and kissed it on the forehead. She's got the romantic ideal, but of course she's bored because she's at the top of her food chain, as it were. And it's all about pretense and impressing people. So again, a stifled situation in society. And the only way Julian can move on is by being exactly in harmony with the correct forms of procedure. The thing with Julian is he's very good at observing, memorising and copying. And some, I have heard a professor say that actually Julian hasn't got anything special about him. Everything he does is by copying something else. However, I don't think that's true. Julian has got the fire to grow. If it were Napoleon's day, he could progress to the top. The reason he's copying all the time is that is the only way you could progress in the society of Paris in, in 1828 to 1830. Stendhal's saying, you are all mediocre, the meanest and stuffiest people are in charge, and anyone that did have any potential to be great, well, they have to just toe the line of mediocrity. And... That's what Matilda is saying here about the dukes around her. Just the idea of doing something out of the ordinary would make them go pale. And so I hope if you're going into reading this or you've just read this book, that you now understand that for about four fifths of the book, although there's the love interests and the affairs and things going on, which it's quite exciting watching Julian try and progress through society and there's, there's some really good bits in it. I hope now you can understand why this point is hammered over and over again. Stendhal is trying to say, look at the society we have got. It's a complete fake. It's full of hypocrites. The only way to progress is hypocrisy and by conforming to the standards. And so France is destined to collapse again. And this is brought out Right at the end of chapter 33, you've just got this constant hypocritical society. And then Julian says, all thoughts of prudence must be abandoned. This age is destined to bring everything to naught. We are marching towards chaos. Prudence, that is worrying about doing the right thing or not, has to be cast away. We've got to go beyond the stuffy drawing rooms of Paris. The grasping of wealth by the liberals, the prestige and the polished manners of the aristocrats. All of this is just hopeless for the country. We've got to cast it away and start again. Otherwise, everything will be brought to naught. And this is where, from this point, from chapters 34 onwards now, you begin to see Stendhal pull every string together and make his critique of the society of his day. Here comes the big spoiler. Towards the end of the book, <laughs> just before Julian um, is set up for life, marrying Mathilde, a letter comes from Madame de Renal. It's actually by a priest who's made her write it. And it denounces Julian as this snake in the grass who seduces women. And the Marquis de la Mole will not let them get married. And so Julian, quite naturally, of course, goes over to Verrières and shoots Madame de Renal in the church. She doesn't die, mind you, but he goes to prison and he's going to say it's premeditated murder. And when he finds out Madame de Renal is alive, he says it's premeditated attempt to murder, which still carries the death penalty. He wants to die. And Mathilde turns up because she loves him and she wants him to find a way out of this situation. There's plenty of people that would help him get out of the death sentence. And she keeps barraging him with all these ideas and he just says leave me to enjoy my ideal life of dreams the ideals he had growing up in various 
his ambition to progress to the top. All these things he had seen, they were real to him. They gave joy, but this mediocre, constant monotony of just fitting in with the governing parties, the tyranny of public opinion, as it was said at the beginning, is no way to live. And Julian hates it. And it's right when he's in prison waiting his death that he begins to actually understand what happiness is. And he finds that he truly does love Madame de Renal and that he was happy with her. And that striving forward politically, that wasn't the thing that brought happiness. We'll just come to happiness very shortly. Let's just take a look at one or two of the comments. Something Julian says is, I've only learned the art of living now that I've come to see death or come to the end of my life. Just before he's sentenced, it looks like his um, counsel for the defence has got him off the death penalty, but Julian stands up and speaks for himself and insults the jury who were made up of liberals who are in the middle class who have become rich. And actually, they've been sort of told what to do by someone in higher authority to let him off. But they, these mean, mediocre, horrible, nasty creatures, when Julian insults their position they sentence him to death. So again, showing it's all a front. Everything's fakery. They don't hold to the liberal ideals either. Everything is in a state of hypocrisy. Julian, though, when he's sent back to his cell with the death sentence, he speaks again to uh, Mathilde, who's still there. And uh, he said, didn't you love my speech when I got up to speak? Because he hadn't planned it. He said, I was improvising. For the first time in my life, I was improvising. And I want to reference this um, professor I've heard speak, and she gave an excellent talk. I don't know where it is now, so I can't provide the link, I'm afraid. But she said that he could only copy, and so he wasn't anything great. This is the line that makes me think that's not at all what Stendhal was saying about Julian. It's several times said he's not like the common men. Remember Father Pirard's words, you are out of the way of common men and this will cause you to be hated. He had what was needed to be great in the correct society, but he had to conform to a rigid, played out role at all stages. Right at his death, he can improvise. He speaks from the heart. He's bold. He's bold and courageous because he knows it means his death. But he'd rather be that than live a hypocritical life anymore. And don't get the wrong idea. Julian is not like a sweet character. He's moody and he's very hypocritical and there's much to dislike about him. But nonetheless, Stendhal's not pointing at that. A young man may have got on in the world. and He's just saying he can't because you're all hypocritical. And the only way to succeed is to follow the common herd and be mediocre. No such thing as greatness exists in France at the moment. Now, this book that I've got is 509 pages long. The reason I tell you this is because on page 500 and 501, you find the entire idea of the book, bang, splattered out, shotgun style, right into your forehead. Stendhal reveals the whole message of the book in two pages. And it's all been building to this. And you know, it's like the crescendo of a great piece of music. At page 430 onwards, things begin to start slotting together. And you begin to get this grasp of Stendhal's critique of society. But on page 500 and 501, right at the end of the book, kablam, it all becomes apparent. While he's waiting for death, Julian, um, has some wine brought into him by the jailer to give him some. He says, could you send two other prisoners in for me to enjoy it with? And these two really common vile folk come in and they say, give us some money and I'll tell you the story of my life. It's really good. And he listens to their story and he says this. His story was revolting. It showed a brave heart in which there was only one passion, the greed of gold. So the lower levels, and he'd seen this in the liberals who were merchants who were climbing or lawyers who were climbing, gold. And it's revolting because he sees that that's the only motive, greed, self. Then he carries on and relates it to the Parisian society he'd known. He said, 
As I gradually became less and less fooled by appearances, I should have seen that Paris drawing rooms are people with honest folk like my father. It's ironic that he calls his father honest folk because his father he comes in and as a go at Julian before he dies. And then when Julian says, I've got some gold to put by, his father's delighted. He's quite happy to get money, even though his son's going to die. So he says, I should have seen that Paris drawing rooms with are peopled with honest folk like my father or clever rogues like these jailbirds who just told me the story. They are right. These drawing room fellows never get up of a morning with the poignant question in their minds, how shall I get my dinner? And they boast of their probity. And when called to sit on a jury, they proudly condemn the man who has stolen a silver fork because he felt faint with hunger. And it carries on. But when there's a court, or when it's a question of securing or losing a ministerial portfolio, so a ministerial position, my honest drawing room folk fall into crimes precisely the same as those the need for a meal has inspired in these two hardened offenders. So in other words, right at the top, at the prim and proper, they're just as gross and base and detestable and grasping and conniving as his father, who is more concerned with the money Julian's left him, uh, rather than his son dying, or the jailbird who's just told a revolting story of his life, which is all tinged with a uh, greed for gold. He's saying the Parisian upper class are just the same. They're all form, but when a, a government position or a, a chance to progress is presented to them, my, they would do just as grotesque things as this, this poor prisoner here has done. But at least he did it to feed himself. They do it just out of greed and out of position. And this is where suddenly this book becomes like it becomes an enormous release when you get to these two pages. It's delightful that it comes so close to the end because the next days afterwards I was walking around sort of bouncing with excitement with what Stendhal was pointing out from all of this. And I really recommend when you persist with the book, even if you feel a bit bewildered at points, and think it's not going anywhere because it really will. And it's it's a case study in making a point through story. Oddly enough, the last thing I'm going to quote is a verse from the Bible, because remember, Julian has learned the New Testament from back to front, front to back in Latin. And so he quotes a scripture and he says, <laughs> everywhere I see hypocrisy, or at least charlatanism, even among the most virtuous, even among the greatest men, his lips curled in disgust. No, man cannot place trust in man. And that's a scripture from the Psalms. Do not put your trust in nobles, nor in the son of earthling man. So no, man cannot trust man. Whether it be the aristocrats, the church, the liberals, you can't trust any of them. The human setup, the societal setup of France is destined to collapse, to come to naught, was the phrase that was used earlier in the book. And this is Stendhal's point. It's sort of only with the light shone on it right at the end that something from the beginning of the book suddenly makes a lot of sense. Julian goes into a church and he sees this little scrap of paper and he picks it up and it has this written on it. Details of the execution and last moments of Louis Jeanrel, executed at Besançon on, and the paper was torn, and on the other side, there was the first step. Now, this is just blatant foreshadowing. Julian is about to take his first step on his journey, and he finds this piece of paper, and a shiver runs down his back. But it says this is the details of of the execution and last moments of Louis Jeanrel. I mean, when you see it written in front of you, it's not hard to see that Louis Jeanrel is an anagram of Julian Sorel. And so what is Stendhal saying? This is not the story of one man. Any boy, any person who wants to grow and progress in the current society, the way France has got it set up, is doomed to fail. And instead of actually progressing to greatness, they're likely to end up dead for standing out of the common way of men. And France can't carry on like this. What's remarkable is this was printed in November 1830. 
if this chronicles 1828 to 1830, why, oh, why does this not have the revolution of 1830 in it? And I think the answer to that is because he had finished writing it just before the revolution broke out. And so in many respects, he saw what was coming. And lots of writers took this idea and began to run with it and use this inward looking nature of Julian to study his own thoughts. This affected Dostoevsky immensely. Um, I do believe, I've got no evidence for this, but I have a suspicion that this affects um, Dickens' work, Bleak House, which I will do a review on at another point and explain why. So that's this review. Would I recommend this book? Yes, for two massive reasons. One, it gives you a great idea of the background, um, the heritage of where the great writers built upon, standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were. He's sort of the forerunner to the psychological novel, but was also helping form the novel of, of the day that we have come to recognise now. Secondly, it's a good story. Although it can linger a bit too long because you can't sense where it's going, it's brilliant because when it finally comes to that last part, everything just fits into place like a Tetris. And you know when you get Tetris just right and then line after line after line disappears? It's like that. And you'll be pleased you read it. It's very worth having in your cosmos um, of characters in your mind to flesh out your own library. So... If you love classics and you like hearing deeper reviews of classic literature, then please hit the subscribe button to this channel so that you never miss out on another episode of Tristan and the Classics. I wish you so much joy in your reading. And if you read The Scarlet and the Black, leave a comment down here about what you thought of it or go to my Instagram account and just DM me and tell me what you thought of The Scarlet and the Black. So um, I hope to hear from you.